All right. So, so grateful for everyone to give up some of your precious time to celebrate Maureen and her amazing body of work. Um, I just think, uh, again, it's just been amazing outpouring of everyone's passion and commitment and love for Maureen and the writing and how she's like given back so dramatically to the, to the writing community. And so tonight is really truly a celebration of her writing, of her life in writing and how she's helped so many of us. I mean, I can honestly tell you, uh, she's been just a giant influence uh, in my writing life and life in general. <laughs> and her generosity is just um, pretty much, you know, on that unparalleled level uh, where she's always giving back and helping. So to kick it off, we're going to have Denise DeHamel read one of her works. Denise, take it away. Thank you, Jennifer, for organizing this. I'm going to read Maureen's poem, Chelsea Suicide. In every myth, there is a secret. Like the time I was looking for my childhood around the next bend in the Palisades and missed it, or the time teeth were discovered in my favorite uncle's yard and he disclaimed ownership and sang falsettos. I went to a meeting on 28th Street. The guy next to me had eyes exactly like yours, corpuscles hardening inside blue irises. He stood too close when he told me I would die if I didn't give up on myself. I thought he was right, but I wanted him to step back so I didn't have to see inside his liver, which was sodden like mine with tinges of red, white, and, and rosé. He talked to himself in the middle of the room, the way he would talk to anyone who used hyperbole. He said, I tried suicide, but it didn't work. When he stuck out his hand, I shook it. I walked with him down 8th, and we parted on 21st. I thought of all the times I dozed in my car near the river, how cops would come to my window and tap, telling me it wasn't safe for a woman in the middle of the day, in a car, by the river, in a world like this one. Now there's snow in Chelsea, and my soul leaps in something I've heard described as bliss. You're never far enough, I realize. And here is the secret. If you'd live, you'd be asleep now, beside me, bent around me like an aura, keeping me safer than I ever thought I had the right to be. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, is Therese uh, on? Therese Fabada, are you on? All right, we'll come back. Greg, Greg Shapiro, you're up next. And thank you again for all your help and, and uh, letting me know who to reach out to and providing help uh, just in the reach out effort. Really appreciate it. Greg, take it My away. My pleasure. Love you, Maureen. I'm reading uh, Constant Dissolution of Molecules from Furious Cooking. And it begins with the epigraph. Some tissue, such as bone, is especially dynamic. Each body structure has its own rate of reformation. The lining of the stomach renews itself in a week. The skin is entirely replaced in a month. The liver is regenerated in six weeks. After five years, one can presume that the entire body is renewed, even to the very last atom. Larry Dossey, Space Time and Medicine. My lovers blur. They say, for instance, you are too good to be true. They stand beneath the bells of Queen of Angels at noon and pretend the noise hurts their ears. They make faces like Chaplin, like Desi Arnaz. Their right thighs have been used for skin grafts, although she was burned in a campfire, she almost lost an arm. There were any number of accidents involving my lovers on something like Bacardi, something weak like Colt 45. One fell between the cars of the two train. One went through a windshield. No, two went through a windshield. One landed on the hood of a truck, one on the pavement in the middle of the Tappan Zee Bridge. Here are the scars, here are the keloids, here are the wounds of my lovers. 
One lover stands before me and her eyes look as deep as another lover's. And she says through Hazel, I am afraid of you. When my body accidentally arches in a swan pose, she looks at me and says, I can see why your other lovers would kill to keep you. My brown eyed lovers inscrutable above me. She plays me like a keyboard, says, you are too good to be true. Her palpitations audible. I am too good to be true, though I give her myself for complex reasons, none of which inspires awe. All my lovers got sober in 1980, 1985, 1990, renewing themselves like phosphorus in the bone, linings of the intestine. My lovers are so fragile. They love to fish and throw the fish back in to wash their hair in the trout stream. And look, every one of them sits beside me as I write and says, I love it when you write about me. My lovers are systematic about control. One hoots out the window at women beneath the owl train. One hints at a liaison with Calvin, an old buddy who wears pantyhose. One is chasing her ex-girlfriend up the stairs at an AA dance. We are all fighting now, my lovers and I, fighting on Broadway in New York, Broadway in Chicago, wherever there is a Broadway, my lovers and I will be fighting. Listen to our voices as they rise above the Hudson, above Lake Michigan. I went to California without a lover. I rented a white Cavalier, this part is true, and drove into high desert far above sea and prairie. It was heady, all that driving and calculation. I was counting my lovers. I was thinking I might fall off a cliff on Highway 1, plunge into turquoise. My mind danced like pollen in stilled water. I thought, at this very moment, my organs are replacing themselves. I am no more fixed in time and space than Minnie Mouse. Even my priceless DNA exists for a few short months, exchanging itself with earth and star. Why? My old heart is probably fodder for lungfish and sponge. My lovers planted at sea like treasure, their tiny eyes blinking light. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Greg. Yay, is Teresa on? She is. Oh, wonderful. Would you care to share next, please? Sure. Edda's Elegy. Uh, for Etta Silver, 1913 to 2013. This is where the poem holds its breath, where the usable truth sways, sorrowing, and the people sway with the truth of it. And this is where the poem enters the dark. This is where the book closes, and the clock opens, and the clock closes, and the book opens to song. So the snow geese murmur, and the coyote swaggers along the aspens. This is where the geese fly unabashedly out and the sky turns white and wild with sound. This is where tumult, this is where prophecy, this is where the poem repents of a language. This is where the poem enters silence, where the child holds the book in her lap, whose pages are aflame with life whose song sways with the usable truth, sorrowing. And this is where the poem holds its breath. And this is where the poem enters the dark. This is where it leaps wild about the child, where the snow geese sees the seamless sky and the universe splits open for one poem. The way a life lived calls on us to praise it. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Next, we have Julie. Thanks, Jen. Um, Maureen, you inspire me boundlessly. This is one of my favorite poems of yours, An Uncorrected Life uh, from the Cave of the Yellow Volkswagen. An Uncorrected Life. The day I decided not to be a saint, I downed highballs until the girl I'd been pacing kissed me with her long tongue and the crucifix fell from the wall. The scratches on my palms scabbed over, the compassion I'd helplessly carried for the world since I was born left me, and I was free to go and sin. 
a red carpet tore the road in half. Strobe slapped all the hills at once. I tooled along beside the wild American. She was a tiger lily in my bucket seat, a paradise of wishes. We switched on and off. She'd hold the map. I'd steer the car. I'd pop the drinks. She'd drive 80 through the farms of Ohio. The sky looked like Omni Max. We built altars everywhere and never went back, even when our faces changed around our eyes and our skin melted and our bones dispersed and flew like baby powder into the night. A flock of comorans posed beside a flock of pelicans where a glacier dumped Minnesota on the shore of Wisconsin. It was so cold, our eyes froze in our binoculars. The birds stayed separate as ice cubes and the mallards in the foreground paddled fast before the hunters. Another time we sat among bees in Michigan and said, we could die if stung. The ducks took off like buckshot. We tried to guess our odds by turning a knob and calling into view the angles of the world. We turned the knob several times. We said a triangle. We turned it again and said a square. Then we turned and turned and finally we said octagonal Mary, don't you weep for us. We drove the ventricle of the Mississippi, counted the veins through Iowa and penetrated the heartland. Oh mama, ancient shape, let it be. A storm rose out of us like a genie. Our clothing blew behind us like a cape. Last week, the Pope arrived in Manhattan. There were Pope t-shirts, Pope hats. He blessed everyone who knelt before him and kissed his ring. He was the king of Catholics, the prince of entrepreneurs. My daughter laughed at the image of the pontiff selling his own paraphernalia. I want a souvenir, I told her. I will wear my souvenir and I will paint a black eye on my face and mourn for myself and my daughter and for the starved multitude. Now bring your eye, one that's grieving, to the telescope's glassy edge. See the universe slide like a woman on a dance floor. How it leaps when you blink effortlessly. How everything it does depends on you. Your breath on the snowy globe. Your eye wide as an observer of something addictive. Nuclear. I had a howdy doody just like that when I was young, I said. You led me to the window where we locked arms and looked at Howie for a long time. We were a frenzy of strings and clacking jaws, unredeemable in love's daft hands. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Catherine Prescott. Catherine, your turn. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Maureen, I love you so much. It's such a joy and an honor to celebrate you and your work. Thank you for being such a tireless poetry advocate and poetry angel for all of us, um, and especially over at SWIM. Just know that we love you. So I'm going to read um, The Integrity of Matter or Peace in the Rose Colored Now. There's blood on the page before this one. See? The dark kicks up air towards bruises his skin. What did Ginsburg say? That he wrote poems to tell his version of things in a world that only tells versions of power. How many days do we have, really? The tornado touches down in the next town north. My heart I am to some ancient classic, maybe Jackson Brown, maybe stylistics. I totter at St. Vrain Creek where it bursts from the Rockies. Cottonwood, catch me. When the child who lives in this house is away, his toys glue. I look the train is speechless and the mottled ball sits still. I forget the name of the film where a woman walks into walls in hopes of entering the womb of an atom. The child atoms are here even as he climbs into the next train home. What a big open space I am. The way these electrons come together. You think I was here. Thank you very, very much. Um, much appreciated. 
next, can everyone hear me okay, first of all? Yeah. Okay. So next we have um, Caridad. If you could please share the poem that you've selected tonight, that would be wonderful. Hi everyone, Maureen, what can I say? I, I love you, I have so much gratitude to you and for you and you are so instrumental to me as a, a mentor, a writer and my friend. So it's my, my honor to be here today. I'm gonna read Blonde Ambition from Furious Cooking. Blonde Ambition. The only miracle I ever wanted as a kid was for my statue of Mary, the mother of God to glow so I could feel enchanted. I moved among grown-ups like a flame. I was punctured by arrows of love. I was boiled in consecrated oil, blameless as risen Jesus, an anxious girl child of small radical expectations, sorry for sins I'd never done. I stayed connected to my healinage like a tiny fish that lives on the benign whale shark and follows him from ocean to ocean in abiding complacency, unlike Colette or Cher. Now when I dream I'm flying, lonesome above other humans, striking ballet poses and lifting off the floor just enough so that they can't touch me, I'm told I'm ambitious. Yet Madonna scares me. I look at her peripherally as if the radiance of her blonde ambition is too bright or she might be contagious. I'm told not to put her in a poem because she will not endure the test of time. She is no more deserving than Campbell's soup or the bee who gave his life when he sank his pricker into my flesh. Meanwhile, I almost died on Friday at five on Half Day Road. I used to tell my daughters not to worry. No one dies until she's ready. For example, my brakes gave out. I was closing in on the windshield. The engine was moving toward me like the will of God, but I wasn't ready. I was totally alive and dead at the same time. It was 1947. I was about to be born, hovering above two women strolling with sailors in Elizabeth, New Jersey. One had the soul of an angel, one the heart of a whore. It was bright morning and the catbirds were meowing in the old trees. The seaport stank. I was waiting for someone more immortal to stroll by, someone pregnant with impossibilities. Is that a crime? For example, you're allergic to bees. The insect is heading toward your flesh like a kamikaze pilot and kaboom, his essence is in your blood and driving toward your vitals like a car with no brakes. You, one, Look at your daughters and memorize the exact radius of their eyes. Two, examine your conscious and, let, and find it spotless as your mother's kitchen floor. Three, feel your death buzzing nuclear inside you, fear lifting you up, cheeks hot with light. That's wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Um, the next two readers that we have coming up are Emily and Jen, both who are Maureen's daughters. And just a special, special thanks to them both for helping me learn who to reach out to and best strategies and all that great uh, secret sauce stuff. So Emily, thank you so much. Your turn. I am also reading from Furious Cooking, A Chorus of Horizontals. You're scanning New York radio in your old Honda on the Sawmill Parkway, headed south around Hastings, where the snow swollen river angles up near traffic. And my God, you've got four webbed feet gliding right in front of your face, practically landing on your windshield. And you flinch and shut your eyes, your heart's percussive, and they've got the nerve to say, honk. Then you're fishing near Muscoot Farm with a young angler who's dead now. This time, you're shirt free in the dusk and he's scared someone might see your small breasts when that V arrives from places south low enough for you to hear the commander set the pace. The brigade of beaks holler back and you're tickled by the alarmed trumpet of a straggler. Wait for me, oh fellas, oh kin. 
and you hug the man to keep him grounded. Those trips with your kids to Terrytown Lake. Who knew the birds would be so rude? They chomp your fingers too. Wherever you go, they follow, slick harpies, as if you're their star, their hunger. They all point to you. You believe this and it keeps you alive through winter after winter when, missing them, you go down to the steely Chicago at the end of your ice-encrusted impossible street and throw bread upon the water. Thank you so very much. Uh, next is Jen Denbo. Hey, yeah. Thank you. For sure. So I'm going to read a poem from a new manuscript that my mom is working on as yet the manuscripts on untitled. The poem is called Save Yourself for Better Times from the Aeneid. I will not save myself for better times. I will use myself up now and then I will use myself up again tomorrow. Why my eyes stay open all night and my heart throws itself to the stars to see which ones decide to stand still and grow a constellation around me. Um, and then I'm also going to read just briefly, um, Marsha Keener couldn't be here and she has a poem that's kind of an inside joke between uh, her and my mom. And it is simply rhubarb. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you for the rhubarb. Um, next, we have Sin. Thank you so much for joining us. Also, Sin. <laughs> Thank you, Jen, Emily. Okay, it took me a second to get the rhubarb. <laughs> I love that. Thank you, Jen. Jen, thank you for organizing this. This is this is really, really, really lovely. And me, hi. The only thing I think that comes close to hearing a poem that Maureen has read is getting to write a poem with Maureen. And um, so I want to thank Jen. Harris for encouraged me to read one of the poems that Maureen and I wrote together. And this is from a series called Evolution in which we kept translating each other's work back and forth, back and forth. I think we have like 12, 12, but this is right in the middle of the series. It's called Evolution Six. In a crouch of sun beside Great Lake water, we breaststroke through pools of foamy light in a pop mail kind of way dot com words vaporizing like communion wafers. Honey, we henna write on bellies, fingertips. We communicate via memory, skin's secret satellite. And once, just once, we floated away completely. When our perpetual ocean comes, we are already gone. Albuquerque, Seed Pearl, Helene Sisu, you don't need a raft in a desert. We are roller coaster princesses, tornado ladies. We are neon dancers screaming, look mom, no hands, because we like bluster. And the wind is red, licorice whipped, like our lips after licking all the sugar off, like a pig's eye, or some say, as if amazed, like the farmer in the dell, red lipped and love whipped too the way God might look again someday after taking a wife who makes hey, hi, ho, holy again. Virgo mother reducing paperback pulp to poems, rewrites Genesis to read, in the beginning, it was dark and we liked it that way. Ink beneath fingernails, blood on the tip of our tongue, our pens indistinguishable from our churches. In every stanza, she is the one who blesses everything. When she spills the wine, it goes everywhere. Mm. Thank you, Sin. Thank you so much. Neil, can you share what you've selected tonight? Can share. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> awesome. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so I, um, I also chose uh, a collaboration, um, the title poem of our, our, our book, Sinead O'Connor and Her Coat of a Thousand Bluebirds. And, um, you know, I, I chose this poem because when I write with Maureen, it's when I felt most happiest as a writer and uh, most at peace. And uh, so I wanted to share this poem. 
I'm so highly evolved that when I dance, I stand very still and bluebirds come and perch on my bra straps. I don't have bra straps, only cups. I only have cups on Sunday. I know now what a smiley face can do and I exercise it judiciously. Although sometimes it's hard to tell whether or not a certain situation merits a smiley face or a machete. Either way, it's pretty funny. In a sense, Seattle is a smiley face, like all things beginning with C. And there are often grins that have something to do with moving the poor to another city, but I've never been there. I've been in a tempest, oil of a pumpkin, pipe of a dream. Things that begin with anno, anoint, anodyne. I am anointed unceremoniously. I am something that soothes and comforts. What am I? A mouse in tights, a tight spot to maneuver. Once I bought jeans with smile lines built in. They were hanging over the side of the bin and they called to me, although nothing about them seemed illuminated, illuminated. Pondering them, I flew in the Spanish. I was Spanish and covered with light, light of a goose, light as a feather, remunerated and stunning. I pulled them over my existing legs and trotted around like a mouse. I was looking for a hole in the wall, proverbially. That's when I found Sinead O'Connor singing and blue birds flew out of her mouth. Her coat was a thousand bluebirds coming to life and flying away like pieces of transformed sexual abuse. And the crowd was pointing fingers at her coat, her blue tongue of feathers. Such an intelligent bird, I thought. And all the cats inside me whispered, mouse. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yay. Um, next up. We have Christine. I am going to read a um, poem called Swin You Song, and it's also a collaboration. Hi, Maureen. It's Christine. <laughs> All right. Swin You Song. There's more to my body than shimmers in the pool in the back of your eye. I lean in and remain emancipated to the solipsistic meter in your heart, to the saliva, the remains of your slack, hand on the way you fondle your own wrist. What wrestles incompatible, insecure? Leave awake and angry your healing. And I forgive you. By the time you read the alibi, I will be sunning and gold among the fountains and foothills divulged, divided society unmasked. There is nothing so brutal, you can't boogie to it, weaving and waving as you go. Thank you, that was so lovely. Um, so I'd just like to point out one thing as we continue on. Nobody repeated their favorite poems to read. It was really remarkable. Every poem was unique. I was like, is there maybe perhaps a better testament to someone's extent of their writing than to have, what, 33 people all choose different poems? <laughs> so uh, that's pretty remarkable. So again, thank you. Sam, are you here? Are you able to share? Hi, everyone. Um, and hi, Maureen. Um, I too am going to read uh, from a collaboration, uh, and I just think it speaks to Maureen's generosity, her amazingness as a poet in all of the collaborative work that she's done. It's certainly been a huge part of my own, my own writing. So this, um, this poem, actually, I'm going to read a version uh, that is the collaboration that appears uh, in Fisher, a poem called Narcolepsy. Um, and this is a slightly different version of that um, from uh, a long piece that, that we worked on a few years ago. She has a knack for sleepiness. And while she falls asleep, she sees a man who says his name is Jesus. Sure, I've heard of Jesus, she says, but this is a different Jesus. He's coming to take me home and that will be good. I can't wait, she adds, a twinkle in the eye. Everyone tries to make her want to stay. But why, she says, a good question. Of stellar significance, I think. This is me talking now, not her. 
I've changed the point of view because the onset of sleep is approaching. I can sense it vaguely and my eyes are like chihuahua eyes now, glazed and half masked. I made pineapple scones before and I'm eating one as I write this. I ate one while I searched for hallucinations associated with narcolepsy. I tried to eat one while I got sidetracked by a hobbit house some guy built in Wales for $5,000. I can't expect much from myself. At 13, I looked out my window and saw orchards burning. Now, I have to admit, I prefer Florida avocados to the more popular Haas avocado. That's because I've gotten used to them, people say. Think of a 13-year-old locked in a hospital with other kids who would rather be dead. I had a vision once or twice involving a dark tunnel or a luminous ceiling. I can see how visions might be preferable to life or death, preferable to visions. It's hard to tell. We're all precarious, sleepy. Sleepy, he laughs high and laughs through his teeth. He chews and side-hatted walks down the street. He stutters and prays, hey, look, you see that? That? You see that guy with the hoodie? Come to get me. It's come to get me. It's come, that little man. This time malevolence, but yesterday he was my good cousin who helped me cross the river. He laughs harder and sees a cool wheat outside the window. Hey, you see that? It's a dog and another red dog. Pretend you see them with me. They could be our friends or the Pilbar wanderer, David Tapu Tapu, that little guy whose primary military specialty is psychosis. Pretend you don't see them when they follow us. Pretend you want a hermit crab. Don't you know I have it figured out? The trick is not to flinch when they breathe on your neck. The trick is to accept your fate no matter what. The trick is to be crafty, but to jump when you get a chance. Thank you, that was really beautiful. Um, next, we have two Stephanies. First up will be Stephanie Lane Sutton, and after that, Stephanie Strickland. So Stephanie Lane Sutton. Hi, um, it's good because I just managed to like get my emotions together. Um, Maureen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I just, I love you um, so much, and um, I've learned so much about how to be a poet and a queer woman from you. Um, I'm going to read uh, the title poem from her new and selected. Uh, of course, she's put out like 12 collections, so it's not really like new anymore. Um, but I'm going to read a part of Fibonacci Batman or a truncated version, which... Um, this is a poem in sections that follows the Fibonacci sequence. So each section adds on to the one before. Um, so here we go. Zero, one, Batman, you are bigger than a palm tree. One, Batman, you are bigger than a palm tree. Two, Batman, you are bigger than a palm tree. You are Egyptian with your ears. Three, Batman, you are bigger than a palm tree. You are Egyptian with your ears and your pretty gold belt. Five, Batman, you are bigger than a palm tree. You are Egyptian with your ears and your pretty gold belt. The sea laps your thighs, Batman. Look how long your gloves are. Eight, Batman, you are bigger than a palm tree. You are Egyptian with your ears and your pretty gold belt. The sea laps your thighs, Batman. Look how long your gloves are. You could lick a cloud, you're so tall. No one is scared of you, Batman. Everyone cruises along in a pleasure boat beside you. 13. When you finish your story, they all laugh. Ha ha, Batman, they say, ha ha. Your hair curls beneath your cowl, Batman. Your toes prod islands. Your wings flap like fruitlessness. 21. You flirt nightly with disasters, Batman, with your tail fins and your speeding heart, with your six pack and your jawline. When you sing at the Met, no one throws eggs at you. When you play bagpipes, no one boos. Your cape wraps around you like a tortilla. Inside, you are upside down and sleeping. You compose sonar like Satie and Hendrix. 34. 
Stravinsky and Shakur. There are heroes in your dreams, Batman. They clamor around you in primary hues, in disguises of nerds and teenagers, pixies and mafiosos, Hansels and dopies. You haunt yourself in single-breasted tuxedos, cashmere coats in bling and blasé, holy archetype, your tectonic. Your face is Grecian, your stubble mirage. No one tweaks your cheeks, Batman. When you speak, they hear pebbles falling down a mountain of silk. They hear the trumpet of a mute goose. 55. Once you were born a winged thing, grief and flapping, nest and pushing, your instincts rose undead around you. You grew troubled as a sea caucus. Your ego was an unwashed pig. Everyone who you knew, knew. They saw you crapping in barns, dangling from door frames. They saw you on rails and highways on Mott Street, Ludlow, St. Mark's Place. You hovered over atria of dying corporations. You flinched in your soft tissue. You bore down like a god, divine player of polo, routine slurper of escargot, in crosshairs and reverb, in ice gin and bootlace, on Bowery and Tribaro, on Gargoyle and Chrysler, oh, dank and rake and velocity, everything grew like the wind-up of a pitch, 89. When a butterfly flaps on Amsterdam, you suit to kill on Madison. When villains practice villainy, you drive zombily towards the bloodshed. Molecules pass psychotically. Storm systems veer and vomit. There's a wind that loves you. This is the wind you're named for. Dracula, son of blood. When people ask what you'd like to be if you weren't a Batman, you say a ripple, a verb. You say a physicist, a pipe dream. Your ego is an equation of chicken guts and Ferrari parts. There's your body in its zoot suit, its underwater shadows. There's your pale ass, your Adam's apple. There's your electromagnetic force field amuck beside your baby grand. No one hears you fart, Batman. Everyone puts you on four wheels and sends you off. Rooftops are your desert, nighttime your skin. You stoop like an old man. Your beard blows away. A butterfly lands in the crotch of a ginkgo on a street with flying buttresses. Wings move randomly around the world. Not really, not random. Once upon a time, you are wholly Batman. Your fate downshifts into infinity. Batman the man. Batman the bat. Batman the Batman. You can't believe you're still alive. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Next, uh, Stephanie Strickland. And let me just say too, that we have students, other writers, other collaborators, colleagues, teachers, friends, family, um, spanning from Denver to Chicago, to the East Coast, and down, of course, to the great Florida, where so many of you are as well. So. With that, Stephanie, thank you. Is Stephanie Strickland on? Oh, it won't be helpful, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maureen, you're an amazing blood jet of poetry and a dear friend. I'm going to read Fiddleheads from uh, Little Ice Age. The first time I saw hundreds of fiddle-fed ferns boiling in an enormous pot, I realized what an odd person I must be to hear tiny cries from the mouths of cooking vegetables. Similarly, when you hurt me, I curled like a mouse behind my third eye. I realized what an odd thing it is to believe as I do in my third eye and the mouse behind it that furls like a fern and whimpers like a fern being boiled on a monster stove beside its brothers and sisters. Poor mouse. The things that make a person odd are odd themselves. Think of DNA, the way it resembles the rope Jack climbed to secure his future 
and that of his aging mom, or the way a sudden wave can drag a child under, that addiction to adrenaline, her siblings farther away and more powerless than she ever imagined, the pure and ecstatic irreversibility of undertow. It's odd to come back to life, as they say. She came back to life. I, I think I'll come back to life now. It's odd to think of something so big we could miss the elephant we're living on, like this planet Earth. Is she alive and we are her brain cells? Each one of us flickering, going out, coming back to life. Even Chicago looks poignant from the top of the Hancock organized and sincere. Think if we were photographing Earth, how dear she would be, how we'd watch her shimmer in the shimmering black soup of the firmament, how alone she'd look and how we'd long to protect her, the way it feels to protect a woman at the height of orgasm, the liquid giving, the seawater slide of coming back to life. When you hurt me, I evolved like a black boned sea creature, translucent nervous system sparking along in the meanest deep where I was small enough to not care. My passions ran to swimming, gulping, spitting bubbles back into new oceans. Once when you hurt me, I slept at a red roof inn. I double locked the door and tried to watch talk shows to keep my mind off sounds like someone suffocating someone in the next room. I thought I saw blood on the box spring and imagined needles and bulgy veins. There's something odd, I thought, about someone whose imagination runs this wild. So often I dream you're here and I wake in the middle of a prayer from my muzzled childhood. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I say, appalled that I'm stuck in 1955 when I need something profane to see me through. Serrano's submerged cross, ginger tea. The idea that we're moving between horizons and the earth is so wise. She sends us winter and red-tailed hawks when we least expect them. I can do this. I say, and the planet shifts imperceptibly. From a great distance, she appears to be at peace. Yeah, that's so beautiful. It's so amazing to hear everyone's voices through Maureen's words. Thank you very much. Next, we have Chantel. If you could join us, that would be wonderful. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for organizing this, Jen. Maureen, I love you and I miss you. And I picked an ocean poem for you. Quote, this big sinking toe and its buoyant inhabitants. When I first arrived, I was shocked by two things. Dinosaurs disguised as pelicans and men of war disguised as dead balloons. Either way, I was naive. I thought an ocean is an ocean. And since I'd married the North Atlantic at seven, what could this lukewarm lake possibly have to offer me. Years lapped by mathematically. I was a fractal and the seasons my humid iterations. I was predictable, the waves, my loyal algorithms. Last week, I floated in the sea while a dozen gulls fought for a crust of pizza above me. When I looked up, the crust came plummeting down along with 12 unholy birds, like they were apostles and I was their Lord. Also, Pirates and mermaids, pirates and mermaids, pirates and mermaids, they're real here. Here's my creed. Fling yourself into the ocean for it is loaded with salt. Float happily among the phosphorescent Floridians, their slick skin, their anemone hair. May their tentacles forever surround you. Beautiful, thank you very, very much. Again, thank you. Simone. Uh, are you prepared to read? Yes. Um, I wanted to read from Maureen's beautiful new book, Undersea. Um, but before I do, I have to actually give a shout out to a much earlier book, um, a collaborative book by Denise and Maureen in 1997, Exquisite Politics, 
which is a book that brought me to collaborative writing and instilled in me a lifelong love um, of both reading and writing collaboratively. So it's so wonderful to hear all of the collaborations. The poem I'm going to read is called The Method of Vanishing Cues. And I just chose this poem because I love her leaping and in all of the poems, she just has such a knack for a final line. The Method of Vanishing Cues. I got myself a cup. It was the end of water and I was the last to drink. I was a revolver at the bed of the dead woman. It was the cruel month and I was inhabited by nightmares. It was a dream, the color of children. I was taking off from MIA. It was the time we drove in circles until we got there. I was extinct in Everglades. It was seasonable. I skied through flambe or sorbet. I was red-handed and tender-headed. It was the best and final cue. I broke into orchids and was gone. Beautiful. Yay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe Mike Pukin had a conflict. Uh, if you are on, give a shout out so I can hear you, but let's go to Brendan next. Hey. Um, so this is, this is a poem that is uh, my favorite kind of poem actually which is Florida apocalypse, climate change um, kind of poem. Um, so it's an honor to, to read this. Metastasis, Gilbert's Bar House of Refuge, Hutchinson Island. When the glaciers armied through Florida, like anywhere else, they left a mess of rocks and sand and animal bones behind them. They did this peacefully, over a long period of time, and the animals felt peaceful as they died in the crush of ancient cold. And present day sea creatures poking through deserted coral remember nothing of those faraway deaths. Yet, when the moon presses down on the Atlantic, like the whole hard body of God, even the smallest worm on the reef will admit to hearing a moan in the ocean's bed. And if you're standing on shore past your bedtime, northern creature warmer than you've ever been in winter, and the moonlight pins you like a moth to the side of the old sea-eaten hand-built bench, you can hear it too. You don't want to. You shake your head against it, but it's real and mixed up with every other sound that's ever occurred up and down this killer beach. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you so much. Next. Okay, so we had Denise vacationing in Ohio, and now we have Reg, who's vacationing in New York. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Um, I am really honored to um, read aloud one of your so strikingly, richly invented poems, Ari, filled with such amazing intensities of imagining. I couldn't resist romancing Debussy because I am a pianist, studied since I was a kid, and this is one of my favorite poems. Romancing Debussy. 17 and sick to death of Bach. In fact, all those B-boys and their prodigious Viennese offspring, all those deep purple pathétique and crimson gavots bored me. I'm a virgin, I said to water lilies, my own reflection in Cologne. I need blue, not bagatelles or rhythmic blood of birth and war. Save me, I said, in third year French. Sauve mon coeur. Daubs of sound divert me from gin fizzes, that tipsy raft of sneakered fawns bouncing around gymnasiums with their pockets bulging. Want a kiss? 
They've learned to grope in damp hallways, facial hair hatching as they speak. My own fingers meander in sevenths and ninths, gusts of blue-green breath, the boys call frigid. Once he, meaning WC, was a cloud. Once Chagall made him fly without wings above symphonies. I saw him at Lincoln Center with the other nerdy kids who hushed in the dark as if slain. Oboe, bassoon, first violin, a hundred little chosen future composers of America. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yay. Um, next, we have uh, another Jack Lag advisor, Ruben. Thank you so much for joining in. What have you chosen Hi. to read? Um, I'm going to be reading Worm Woman Circling Lake, uh, which um, may have first appeared in the uh, 90, 1992 winter issue of the Paris Review. Uh, I love you, Maureen. Um, this is such an honor to be here and to celebrate you. Woman Circling Lake. Oh, transcendent, this aqua blue and all these health nuts running back and forth hold nothing. No sea gnome, no salt to scour your bones clean. Only placidity and motionlessness, no dark fugues or phosphorescence. It's your turn to stir the waters. Don't back away from brittle plains and dry wheat, saying you're too far above us for encumbrances. This is your place, your time. Chicago, end of a millennium. Your faint hearted sallies fall deep into space, closer to no one who knows you. See, cloudling, how the collie pup chases the gray squirrel up bare sleeping trees. How old snow banks the blue green line of Michigan. The collie is so happy and powerful. The squirrel steals from ash to oak as if possessed by abandon, rising higher into sky than any jubilant unchained creature. You are the end of winter, sea light. Little star eater, come back. It's not your turn to die. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Next up, we have something a little bit different. Steve Butterman has going to read select excerpts from um, some nonfiction work. So Stephen, do you wanna talk about that? Hi Maureen, hi CTS, hi extended family, fam biological family, queer family. It's so, I'm so happy to be with, with all of you here tonight. CTS, that's what I call Maureen. Uh, some of you may know what it stands for. For others, it may still be a secret. Um, I will come out with that later. Um, but today is an incredible day of celebration. Um, uh, this day is for you. And it coincides with the fact that my book came out also just today, my new book. Uh, so um, this is a special day indeed. And you're all over the acknowledgements as you should be. Um, for so many reasons. So I will read very brief uh, excerpts from a five part piece essay called The Queerosphere. Maureen uh, wrote this uh, as part of a collection on lesbian students, teachers and students in the classroom. And this piece again is The Queerosphere, Musings on Queer Studies and Creative Writing Classrooms on Poetry, Creativity and the Fleetingness of Things. One. Whenever I think of the queer sphere, I think of the first time I went to my friend Steve's queer studies class and I was a big queer about to talk about queer, queer, queer. I wasn't too self-conscious with a big Q carved into my forehead and Queen Latifah tattooed on my right ankle. No, really. My first time in Steve's classroom, I was nervous 
because I was no longer with the woman I'd been with in the book of poems his students had just finished reading and were going to ask me questions about, and that just seemed wrong. For the sake of time, I'm skipping section two, going to an excerpt from section three, called In Constant Motion slash Mutilation. This phrase interests me, and it raises another memory from the Andy Goldsworthy documentary Steve and I just watched, where the sculptor talks about destruction. I'm all for destruction as a part of creation. So constant motion must mean mutilation, although the word destruction appeals to me a little bit more than the word mutilation, because mutilation seems to come from without, whereas destruction, to me, can come from within. Am I judging that? One of the basics I embrace is don't judge. Also, don't limit. This may make me more queer than who I sleep with, certainly, and perhaps extremely queer in the way I create and teach, because if all is in constant motion, which it is, and we are, then nothing can be judged because nothing stays itself long enough to be judged or analyzed. Well, anything may be judged or analyzed, but perhaps it is queer to remember that one is only analyzing a certain iteration of a certain thing or a certain person that exists in a single moment of time and space. Section four. I guess there are many ways to and around the pedagogy of poetry. A wise lesbian once suggested to me that poetry was not generally accessible simply because its ideas had not been thought of yet by the general population, that its nature was of one who has yet to come, quotes mine, Maureen's. In this way, it spearheads creativity and perhaps culture itself, leading us forward through its images and metaphors. I would say, skipping, sorry, for the sake of time, I would say that poetry is not inherently a queer literary genre, but that because poetic license exists, even in the mind of the general population as an accepted possibility, poetry lends itself to a queer literary genre a bit more than the others. I'm troubled by theory, but that would be like saying I'm troubled by the message of Christ or the teachings of Buddha or the way Isis mothers, uh, mothers us or Moses leads us into the cooperative sea. And I am. There's a coot moving across the lake now. I am like him in that I am moving like a shadow across a larger body than mine because I am dedicated to the other side of the lake and therefore preoccupied with my vision. This is where my life resembles the life of Mary Shelley, the way she sat down with a few friends one night and said, quote, let's see who can write the scariest story ever written. I am like that about so many things, trying to scare myself and everyone else with my inability to paddle in a straight, predictable line. And finally, an excerpt from section five. It's like watching a person move from the sun to the moonlight. No, vice versa. There is a shift. Who cares in which direction? Neither is elite, neither from a place of sore loser. I can't remember when I was sure. I've been so queer for so long, I can't remember any other name besides Slim Shaky. Am I hopelessly unable to write analytically at this point? Do I want to do that in this piece of writing that borders on the prose poem? The prose poem, now there's a queer genre if ever. <laughs> I want to stay here now, sitting in the sun until my vitamin D level rises above sea level. Why are the gulls upset? How do I know they're upset? Am I frustrated because I haven't written a damn thing for my left brain all day and my right brain is mutating with each stroke of the keys? No, it is all the same, all light and all the moon's umbra. Who else is so lucky they get to do this, sit and feel this thin, soft moment? What is queer about the classroom is that it is always moving like those coots, those gulls, that it defies definition, but not in a defensive way. It simply falls through the fingers like lake water, organic, authentic. Is this too much to want? Is queering a fractal situation or do fractals live deep in the bodies of queers as they live in anyone? That is the joke and the Bible story. The truth you might say, if there was such a thing 
as truth if there was such a thing as you. Written in Jensen Beach, Florida, 11 years ago in March, 2010. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Next up, we have Kate. Kate Calvi? Uh, don't, I think you're muted. Unmuted, yes. There I was you just go. The unmute button. Perfect. Um, yeah. Hi, and Maureen, um, among the many, many things we've shared through all these many, many, many years, it's kind of shocking, but there they are, uh, is that we are absolutely besotted with our amazing daughters. So I have chosen from Sweet World, my daughters among dragonflies. In the midst of a hundred, maybe a thousand dragonflies, I bring my daughters before the God of children and demand an audience. I have a right to demand after all. I'm not the only one who brought them here, am I? To the giver of breath, I say, lead them swiftly through a thousand dragonflies. To the architect of womb and nipple, keep them safe. Once on an L platform in Chicago, I stood in the midst of dragonflies heading west. Now I'm west and the dragonflies are giddy with sun, circling silently around me as if I were a blooming lilac tree. Were they always headed toward this future me, my arms outstretched, heart bombarding heaven? It always chokes me up. <laughs> <laughs> a, good, a good poem should do that, right? Yes, yes, That's wonderful. Um, is Jen on? Jen Carrot. Yes. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so honored to be here to be celebrating Maureen. And I just want to tell a really quick anecdote um, about her generosity that you guys are all familiar with. But when we started Swim Every Day, which um, many of you know, some of you probably don't know, but um, we reached out to several South Florida poets that we were all familiar with and asked them to contribute a poem to get us off the ground. And many of you in this forum were published very initially. And we chose um, one of Maureen's poems. And she said, I'm so glad you chose that one because I wrote that specifically for you. So she didn't just contribute a poem, she wrote one for us. And that is just such a Maureen thing to do. She's just such a generous literary citizen and it just makes me happy to think of her and her work and this whole existence of her body of work. So I'm going to be reading not that poem because somebody else is going to be reading that poem. I believe it's called Among Us Divine. Um, I'm going to be reading Planes Fly in Formation Over the Backyard as in war movies. I think this is such a visual poem and you can really see it. And because I'm under a flight path, I hear this poem every day in my head. Furious, furious. Oh, hey, Mike, can you mute? Sorry, Jen. <laughs> Sorry. <Yikes. laughs> hey, you know it wouldn't be a Zoom reading if we didn't have at least a few tech issues. <laughs> Zoom things out. Um, planes fly in formation over the backyard, as in more movies. Forever is so unfathomable it cannot be held responsible. For it is the joyful repetition of the increased effect of sun at high altitudes. Meanwhile, birds are wise in thin air but live such a short time. One lies broken in the snow, others surround it, screeching. Normally I would say there are no images for infinity, but today I am not so sure. Infinity flows in a blood red path to itself. War spills infinitely into other wars. Five planes fly in formation over my backyard, as in war movies. In reality, I kneel beside this infinite bird. I am nothing but a string of bells, the hand of a minor god. I will walk in snow four more times before spring arrives in the foothills. Snow of burial and keening jays, the opposite of forever. 
That was so wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing that story because I honestly feel that that's why everyone's here. Her generosity of spirit, the way she's inspired us all. So thank you sincerely. So um, I'm going to take a little detour since now I know that Mike's on. Mike, are you in a place where you're able to share the poem that you selected? Oh, hold on. Let me, I muted you. Uh, I'm learning. Uh, sorry, two seconds. All right, well, what, actually, while I'm doing that, Penny, would you like to read what you've chosen? Sure. Um, and Penny, and I'm going to read Thank you, uh, yeah, I'm going to read uh, Jesus and Puberty. Um, and it's from uh, the, the book Sweet Jesus. So um, I was the same age as Jesus when he left home and taught in the temple. I sat on the edge of my life. The Holy Ghost was in my mouth. Water rose and fell around me. And I stepped like an eagle from her nest to begin. I knew everything that had come before, everything that would come after. I guess you could say I was obsessed with the hand gestures little Christ was making in the Bible pictures, the way the learned men leaned their heads toward him, the possibilities of all that blood. My blood descends like a million possible infants. On Halloween, we have a party, boy, girl, then down my legs and into my socks, dark jelly, old cherry wine. My childhood slides into the earth. Oh God, I say for the first time, meaning damn. I grow lighter now, but you don't see me in the dark. Even with these pointy lights pointing blue and cool as raspberry ice. I'm digging deep into loam, forcing myself to bulb in the thick of earth. Everything in me is begging to swell and burst. Where will I get the cash to feed my roots? Where will my roots grow, go when they've drunk all there possibly is to drink? Jesus, Jesus, Bo Jesus, banana, banana, Bo Jesus, me, my, Bo Jesus. He came to me in his Bo Jesus outfit soiled but shiny raiment, indicative of resurrection, the large sandals made in town by a leather smith. He said my name too softly, as always, and I was hooked. Once he took me to the woods behind the brown split level, behind the old stone wall, wife with rattlers and placed me on a rock. The rock was cold in summer, cold in winter. It sat below me and it drew in my wound. I was a small iron on its root, and it listened. Jesus flew among the trees I named and gave persona to twin elms, tall virgins. Everywhere figures of light came down from the sun, and the child turned the rock warm. The rock blazed bright where the woman child lay naming trees. You're muted, Jen. Oh, thank you, Mike. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, did you want to share your poem? Oh, I sure do. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I do. So, um, I fell in love with Maureen Seaton uh, when this book came out, Furious Cooking. And one of the best poems in that book is called Furious Cooking, which I'm going to read. It's kind of before you begin, you dump the old beef stew down the toilet and flush it, thinking, good, watching gravy splat around the shiny white tiles, where the chicken spread eagled on the butcher block could be anyone and you don't even bother to say thanks for your life chicken or regret the way the little legs remind you of just that where the bay leaves aren't 
eased in, but thrown, voila, into the sizzling olive oil, which burns the poulet nicely, along with the onions, alerting the fire alarm, and still you think, good, let the landlord worry, I'll burn this bitch down. It's kind of, it's the kind of cooking that gives your family a, a guide to Italian style pain. Even if it's only fricassee, the way your Nana used to make it. She was so pissed, she painted her kitchen ceiling red. Remember the Irish soda bread chicken and all those green veggies and heavy cream your poor mother yelled so loud about? Oh, the calories. Furious cooking. The kind where hacking the pollo in the bits with no names you look up, you look up to see the windows steamed like a hothouse. In fact, it's so hot you strip the bare skin. And now you're cooking mad and naked in that bartender's smock with the screw you'd like to stick into some big cork right now. Cooking everyone can smell from the street. What the fuck they say and hurry home to safe food. Yours, a rank hit of ambulation and sacrifice, although no one recognizes the danger. I used to wonder about the Portuguese woman on the first floor, what that odor was that drifted up on Saturdays into my own savory kitchen, how it permeated Sunday and Monday as well, all that lethal food left to boil on her big stove from the old country. Now I know she was just furious cooking. That aroma was no recipe you'd find in any country, a cross between organs and feathers and spinal fluid and two eyes, not to mention the last song in that chicken's throat before it kicked the bucket in the snow, in the prime of life, with all it ever wanted, you could etch on a dime and spin blithely into a crack in the kitchen table. Furious, furious cooking. That's fantastic. And it brings me right back to Chicago and the beginnings of meeting Maureen the first time and Reg and Simone. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next up, uh, we are going to hear from Nicole Talman. Hi, hey everyone. Oh, Jen, thank you so much for organizing this. It's been, it's been so much fun to hear all of these poems. Um, I'm going to read from Furious Cooking as well. So thank you for leading us in that direction, Mike. Um, I'm going to, I chose Self-Portrait with Disasters. It's one of my favorite of, of Maureen's poems. So um, here we go. Self-portrait with disasters. Imagine, I once walked the entire length of Croton Hudson and Hurricane Bob because I liked the smell of ozone and destruction. Then fell into the snow so deep I drowned, but that was in a dream. And since then, the only thing I fear is waking. Now when people hate me, they say I must think I'm powerful. The man who shot himself in Missoula, on the other hand, had no power. Once he said he saw his wedding mattress floating down Broadway in South Yonkers. His wife had thrown it out and a flood rose and loosened it from the trash. I thought how amazing that Broadway stretches from Albany to Battery Park and back again, that beneath my feet lies the bedrock of a shifting continent, above my head, dust of a trillion dying stars. In fact, I myself, am suspended in the devastation. For this moment only, I am the light. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Nicole. Next, we have Lenny. What have you selected to share with us tonight? Well, uh, it's sweet world, but before I read that, I'd like to say thank you for uh, reaching out to me. And, and I am so honored, as others have said, to be here a part of the what I suppose is the Maureen Seaton Orchestra. Um, <laughs> That's you know, true. All these tones and voices and rhythms and music of everybody chiming in is just terrific. And uh, Jennifer, I think you invented the first Zoom chat book here, right? I mean, it's um, 
basically is what this is, right? It's a collective <laughs> poems, audio visual. All right. So this is Sweet World. It uh, starts with an epigraph. Uh, I never had a nemesis before. I kind of like it. And that's Felicity Smoak, The Flash. Wonder what I'd be today if I was still married to my Wall Street husband, besides married to a Wall Street husband and puking gin in a silk sheath at Delmonico's. I might be a blonde size four. I might be a secret Democrat or a weekend lesbian. This morning, five planes flew over the yard in a V and I was about to dig into a pile of lavender pancakes al fresco. The V flew low and slow. It flew loud and ominous. It alarmed me, sounding a lot like the war movies of my 50s childhood. My cranky chihuahua was proverbially biting at flies and I was sitting there not thinking about hate. Recently, I experienced life with cancer an intoxicating time, richly infused with the liquor of death, but good too, because no one expected much of me and I was left to my own mind, which is what I'm missing most these days. Unless that, unless that's it over there, screeching on two wheels around the racetrack. Today I typed Nos, G-N-O-S, instead of song. And I wondered if it was some new app designed to mess with me. I've never thought to call the world sweet before. A nemesis can do that for you. Make things taste different. Suddenly, you're a hero in all this devastation. And you're still standing in the middle of it. Love you, Maureen. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Next we have uh, another one of jo uh, Maureen's publishers, Joan Handler. I think you're muted, Joan. I think so. <laughs> Welcome, me. thank you so much for joining us. Hi, hi, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And as everyone else has said before me, it's an honor to have been invited and it's an honor to know Maureen. Um, she was enormously generous to me when I was a, um, a young writer and, um, and very insecure and unsure of myself. And Maureen really, had my back. And, um, and so it's been an honor to have the opportunity to publish a book of her, of her poems. And um, from that, I'm going to read <laughs> The Astonished. Like lovers, the astonished remain silent for years at a time. Their meals are cunnilingual, star fruit, fennel, cream of coconut palm. Their voices resemble the sugar scented acoustics of children. Praise flows toward them and away for the astonished are spun of hope. They meld universes, ours and theirs and theirs and others. They look forward to the day when blood will rise into clogged water, when everything ever known has blown away. Sometimes a woman maroons herself on the island of astonishment. If she remembers how, if her body can navigate time, the astonished watch her land in trees the size of worlds. They love her until she dies or lives, whichever astonishes her 
more. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Holly, would you like to share with us next? Yes, I would. I'm really happy to be part of this chorus of um, Maureen's poems in our voices, and I hope that it pleases her no end. I'll follow on Joan and say the confidence that Maureen has in me, she's more sure of me than I am. Um, and I feel like it's one of her great generous gifts of um, seeing what we can't yet see. Mm -hmm. I picked a poem of, about South Florida that echoes some of the palette of the one Chantel read, there's mermaids and tentacles and banyans. Um, Maureen has a very, Maureen has a weird and enchanting relationship how she loves South Florida. And I want to assure you, of course, Maureen, that South Florida loves you back double. And this is her, it's entitled Sonnet for Snapper Creek. Now I'm almost killed again on the Snapper Creek Expressway, my shadow left behind on blacktop like a map of this precarious sinking city. So I invent an odd task for myself. Ephemera, I decide, harmless but illegal, that tissue in felon wind, a blip beneath radar. And I enjam the law in small ways, felonious poems sailing from the sealed lips of mermaid sculptures, the tentacles of banyans, stuffed into bottles I toss into Snapper Creek, the creek, not the suicidal highway, begging fish, fowl, and humankind, oh, Miami, save us. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much. So Sonny needs to read next. Uh, and so let's welcome him and please share what you're going to read, Sonny. Hi, thank you so much um, for having me. Um, love you so much, Maureen. Um, I am going to read Tit with Shelf Life. <laughs> I think of it as a tiny earth, a typhoon in a glass globe. I think of it as blood beneath a door, faces on a vaulted ceiling. I think of it as a severed head, toe bone of a sloth. I think of it as frightened, a twitchy metaphor, frightening, boo. I think of it as a random bird impaled on a random tree, hawthorn. I think of it as a celestial non-sphere, phobos, fear, or demos, terror. I think of it as a soul unraveling, newly dead or newly born. I think of it as a rogue wave, a god particle accelerator. I think of it as a pit harboring a fruit tree, plum. I think of it as omega or pi or any transcendental body, uncountable. I think of it as pew sliding off a freight train, plutonium. I think of it as a haunting, a bell tower, a bell. I think of it as a pike with ulcerous flesh and missing eye. I think of it as a cell whispering, I am in everything, everything am I. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonny. Um, Damara, would you care to share what you've selected? Sure. Um, I want to say hi to Maureen. I love you. And um, I'm not sure if you remember, but you probably do. Uh, when I met you back in the early 2000s as a potential dropout out of college, and I placed all of my poems in your hands, every single one of them. I never showed anybody. And you looked at maybe three, and you said, you're in. I want to thank you for inviting me into the writing community, the first community that I had ever been able to be a part of. And since then, I have kept on writing. <laughs> I'm reading When I Was a Mermaid. When I was a mermaid, I was useless and briny as a truckload of seahorses in Kentucky. My underwear assets left to the imagination of course whoever's dashed against cliff sides 
as if my tongue spun silver, not seaweed. Worst scenario, me, stranded on land without the scallop pasties, a ship to shore, chastity any brackish maid might wish for. White rock or serena, I was more than my torso and tresses, scales, fillets, fluttery fins, faster than big blue boring south through silverfish and aqua waves. I was reported alone, dotting on humans while sinking them into graves and infidelity. No matter my slings were fuckless, tail thick with spoon and salt, my species incomprehensible to kings and sellers. When I was a mermaid, all missiles and luminescence, I spoke sonic and swam with the art genius of mammals who winked at me as I climbed Celtic and two leg from seawater to island where breath entered me quick sexually. Thank you so much, Tamara. That was wonderful. And I especially love what you shared. So thank you. It's so incredible. Uh, Mia, we just have two more and if people have been amazing. I can't believe we got through everyone. So Mia, could you please share? Yes. Hi everyone. Maureen, who I sometimes call Alice and she sometimes calls me Paloma. Maureen, when you, 13 years ago, I sat across a booth from you at Time Moon on US One and you said, hey, let's write a poem together. And that one moment like cracked my world, my teaching, my heart, everything wide open. And I'm so grateful to you for that. So I'm gonna read a little collaboration that we wrote called Monster Inviting Storm. It's an ekphrastic, exquisite corpse collaboration sonnet because Maureen. <laughs> Monster Inviting Storm. There is your body using itself up before it leaves. You knuckle your way through the forest. The storm gathers its materials, longing destruction. Dark wax drips down your cathedral walls. What made you a monster? Was it luck? I invented sex. Then I invented St. Augustine's notion of sex. Then I, will you seek another body when the storm wastes this one? Will you remember yourself when you are only ashes and cat's claw? Look at the colors of your hope. Remedy comes from remedial, as in nothing fully works. First time having sex with a storm? I hear an ache in your not trying to quake voice. What a beautiful accident you are. Now half feather, half rustle. I love you, Maureen. Oh, that's so sweet. So um, I thought I would end tonight with the last poem in Undersea, and it's called Among Us Divine. I patted my own sea and you came to me, sort of unscripted, sort of splendid, a loose bolt in the imagination, the very one that got me in trouble, sipping lilac wine, stolen from you five minutes ago, remember? You were breaking in your ukulele, all those tiny hand movements. I glued myself into a collage and you flew. There was something old school about us or scientifically unsound. We made faces at czars. My eyes were browning then and yours were shaped like starfish. You never know who you'll run into as you sweep the sea with a slender stalk. I've carried my life inside me for so long now, never knowing where it would take me. So irretrievable, so stark raving mine. Thank you everyone for joining us in the celebration. Thank you, Maureen, for being you and helping everyone. And everyone feel free to shout out to Maureen. Thank you. Thank you, Jen.
Love you, Maureen. Love you, Maureen. Love you. We love you. Love you, Mama. Love you, Maureen. Thanks. Love you, Mama Maureen. Love you. Thank you. Love you, Sister. <laughs> all right <laughs> take care and there will be yeah. more hopefully readings of everyone's work so thank you thanks again bye. 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 bye bye everybody <laughs>